have to worry about ourselves. We have to worry about what we believe and how we walk with the Lord. And so um, those, especially those churches that are closed today and, and around, um, some I don't want to close. I don't intend on closing. Um, if they say certain crowds, they'll have to come count them. Um, that's the way I feel. And, and I, if they limit the crowd, we'll just break up into groups and do multiple services. Um, right. We, we, we're, we're not going to quit worshiping Jesus is what I'm trying to say. We're not going to quit laying hands on the sick and seeing them recover. We're not going to stop because that's a gospel. Now, those that decide to, I'm not accusing them. I'm not angry with them. I'm not upset or even disappointed with them. I understand what's going on. Um, I heard a prophecy last fall concerning what's going on now, and it's, it's kind of strange. I didn't think much of it at the time. I did a little I, because I, I obviously did enough that I remember it. Um, I was in a meeting with some leaders and they were talking about this prophet who had prophesied, and the guy's always accurate, that um, there would be a plague that would come and we'd have to deal with it till Passover, which is, which is you know, what other people call Easter. Passover is just a, a few weeks away, mid, middle of April. And so um, it'll be over by Passover. Amen. 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 I believe that. And um, doesn't doesn't matter. It's the word of the Lord, so it really don't. Um, <laughs> it's going to happen, or it's not. If it's the word of the Lord, it'll happen. And um, that's one thing. The second thing is, a few weeks ago, I was reading and studying um, on nothing to do with plagues or anything like that. But I come across some interesting thing about this God. In the, in the New Testament in Caesarea Philippi where Jesus was teaching where, where Jesus actually said Matthew 16 to Peter he was standing at Caesarea Philippi and he said blessed are you Simon for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you but the Father in heaven he said and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it well Jesus was standing on a rock in, in there's, there's a waterfall near there and a, a stream that comes out of the mountain and it's called the gates of hell. It's on Mount Hermon. And he was at that very place. And the chief god of that time was a Roman god named Pan. Pan. We get words like, like the Pan-American sports or pandemic or pan whatever you know pan, there's a i know in africa we had they were saying they always use the term pan african um and it means across or over it means included it's it's a worldwide pandemic and the chief chief work of this god of pan is to instill fear and um we have crossed a line somewhere and it seems like the whole world is crossing it right at this time into a realm of fear and as i was praying i've been praying because it's a sign this is something different than just people being stupid um it's odd how it really reveals the heart of our nation um the first thing we go for is comfort it's, it's really odd because we don't know hunger and um we will though we will people be trading toilet paper for beans when they get hungry are you all okay I'm not making a joke I'm telling you our nation does not know hunger and so the thing they think they need the worst is toilet paper and it's just really a, and, and you may be one of them but it's just really a snapshot of how fat and gluttonous and lazy and silly we are and um, we we have to we we have to adjust those some adjustments need to be made in our life. And some of you think, oh, I just don't care. I'm not going to live without toilet paper. Um, you spend too much time thinking about poop <laughs> if that's your biggest concern. I'm telling you the truth. You've got bigger problems. And there's something that we've crossed over. It's as if we've went over an appointment, a, a time that we don't have answers for. 
and no one does. And that's the, the scary part. The, it seems as if, to me, and, and this, is, this sermon isn't going to be about the coronavirus, um, but it seems to me as if this time we've entered, um, the, the, the chief of it is just fear. We don't know what's going on. And it's, it's either our media and our government is way overreacting or they're not telling us everything. And so that makes us even more unsettled as, as a whole. But it's not a time to get angry with media and, and presidents and, and different ones. In fact, President Trump called for prayer today, a day of prayer. Yeah. And um, I got a text from from some people that know and they shared a text from Jensen Franklin that, that or tweet or something. I, I don't know how it all worked out. Um, I've got a phone and it, there's like 20 ways messages come to me and I don't understand any of them. And I don't know why we all just can't use one, but we, we got all these different things. And so someone either texted me a tweet or tweeted me a text. <laughs> and President Trump is right now as we speak is in on, not in present, but is joined on streaming. Whether, whichever avenue it is, with um, with Jensen Franklin's church in in North Carolina, so we thank God for that, yeah. and yeah. we thank God that at least we know people are praying. And I'm not campaigning right now. Um, I'm not. I'm not a. I'm not a Trump man. I'm a Jesus man, and um, I don't think President Trump has any more answers than anyone else. But we got to pray. Um. But it seems like the whole world together is crossing a timeline that we're going to look back on, kind of like 9-11. Um, and from this time on, there's going to be increased pressure on believers. It's going to increase pressurizing or pressuring us not to believe and that'll increase is it going to begin with words at some point it'll be laws and fines and punishments imprisonment banishment isolation whatever but what's going to happen is in the very future in, in I shouldn't say very near future I don't understand the timelines because I don't, I don't, I don't do the charts. Um, but I know the world, and we're not reacting to the fear like everyone else is. And if we are, heaven help us all, because you're the only ones with the answer. We're the only ones with the answer. And so I know some of you are getting scared now. Um, you're not supposed to be afraid. This demand has already been there. This pressure is already there. Uh, that's why right off the bat, I mean, Christians begin to shrink back on, on these times. And, and it's, it's, it's amazing to me is, is you know, we, we'll, hand sanitizer isn't going to protect you. Um, if everyone used it, maybe. But this thing is out. It's going to get out. A few weeks ago, I was asking God, and I, I don't talk like this very often because I, I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet, but God still speaks to me. And I asked him, I said, what is this about? And, and he said, it's going to run its course. You're, it's going to touch America. And that was before it was here. It's going to touch us. It's going to impact us. It's going to impact your life. And... Um, I don't suggest hoarding, but I suggest wisdom and um, making sure you can feed your family and take care of yourself. Um, but that's not the goal. The enemy wants to put you in a stranglehold. And they're, they're limiting, I, I think the number now for Arkansas is 250 groups of 250. Well, we're pretty safe. Almost everyone in Leadhill could get together <laughs> and still 
and still not be affected. Um, we're going to be okay. But worldwide, this is, this is really a serious affront. And, and you have to see beyond, am I going to get coronavirus? It's a serious affront to the gospel. It's a warfare that's being brought against the gospel to stop us from evangelism. Because friends, we are winning. We are winning. For the first time in the history of mankind, salvation rate is higher than birth rate. We're winning. I know in Kenya they're not allowed to have meetings over a thousand and so they've had to cancel crusades and all these big meetings and, and, and that's taking place all over the world. But God's going to prevail. We're going to see the end of it. We're going to come through it. And here's, here's the truth. We, if, um, we, have to, we have to be led by God in these times because if it's a temporary thing, we don't want to act like permanent jerks. You understand? But if it's a permanent thing, we have to resolve in our heart who it is we're going to believe and what we're going to fear. And that's for everyone on the face of the earth. And, and God is the Lord and there's nothing to fear. There's nothing to fear. If God be for you, who or what could be against you? There's no disease that we should fear. In fact, the, the Bible says that we have um, been ruled and kept in bondage by the fear of death. Yes. By fear of death. That's, that's what keeps people in bondage. So I don't want you in any bondage. If you'll turn to Luke chapter 22. <laughs> is everyone okay? Yeah. And, and I'm, not, I'm not preaching doom this morning. I'm just telling you we crossed a line. We have crossed the line. Just like from the time of 9-11, how many traveled, how many flew in an airplane before 9-11? Anyone else? How many flew in an airplane since 9-11? Was that not different? <laughs> Did that not change the whole way you travel? Um, <laughs> I traveled for a living during that time. And there were times, there were times, there was a season in my life that because of all the places I'd been and all the terror attacks that seemed to happen around us, that every time I flew, I got to go to the side room and get a special, special interview. Um, this is going to change the way we do society. And it's planned. It may not be planned by government. I don't think it's Democratic or Republican. I think it's demonic. Amen. And it's going to change the way we interact as society. Here, as far as the church goes, I'm not afraid to shake anyone's hands. Um, I'm not a big fan of hugs. Um, not because I'm afraid of your viruses. I'm just not that into it. Um, I'd have said some people, I love you. I'm not afraid of hugs. I just don't. I don't see why you need to hug me. Uh, with that said, there are a lot of people that will come and go just soon not shake your hand and not hug you because of this. And um, don't be silly. Don't try to make them shake your hand or hug you. That is not your ministry. That's not your spiritual gift. It always amazes me. People want to give me a hug. They want to take one. They don't want to give it to me. They're trying to take one. You all right? Everyone laugh a little. It's okay. Don't get offended. Don't get offended. I love you as much as if I was hugging you. Don't get offended. Um, you, don't, you don't have to do that. And in fact, in this time, it, it might be best not to. Um, amen. It's a good word. It's good wisdom. It's good wisdom. You, think of it this way. That person you're shaking hands with might have cooties. They might have critters. It'd be better just to leave them there. Turn to Luke chapter 22. I'm sorry about that. Um, <laughs> a 
like I said, I'm not afraid. I remember we lived through that mad cow disease, and we we lived in that that place is in Isapingo, which was right across the hallway for, highway from us, and most of our ministry was in that community. Almost all of it was in that community, and um, we didn't wear gloves when we laid hands on people. We didn't put on hand sanitizer between each one. We also lived in the midst of the AIDS virus, which was another virus which can be contacted through um, bodily fluids, um, different ways. And, and one, of them, one of them is saliva, one of them is sweat. And we'd lay hands on those people. God would heal them. God would touch them. God would love them. And um, was sometimes in communities where the, the rate was as high as 50%. Some days, not some days, if you, if you dug a grave, let's say you dug a grave on Friday for Saturday, which all the Africans do all their funerals on Saturday, so everyone's wearing black on Saturday. By morning, there would be several bodies in it of people that couldn't afford graves. And so you didn't dig a grave till Saturday unless you want company for your relative. Um, Honestly, I don't care if you put me in a mass grave, a little grave, a big grave. It don't matter to me because there ain't no grave. And hold her body down. Um, I really don't care. I really don't. I really have no preference. Um, <laughs> well, that's unchristian. No, it's just, it's just I, don't even, I don't even care what you think I'm going to be doing when I'm dead. I know where I'll be. And so these, these things, we've been through them. I remember cholera in one of the areas we lived and worked was huge. And, um, you know, I didn't drink the water, but I didn't become afraid. And so I'm not afraid to shake your hand, hug you, pray for you, whatever we need to do. But be wise with one another. And um, if they're asking us not to shake hands and hug people, you, you won't die. Let's, let's comply. Amen. Amen. That's not part of our faith. That has to be a part of our faith. Right. I've been waiting for this so I could say that. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, turn to Luke chapter 22, 31, because you all know that I'm real timid and shy. I won't ever say anything controversial from the pulpit. You know how I am. I want to talk to you um, along these lines because, <laughs> um, listen, I, I'm, I'm really not afraid. I'm really not in any way, shape, or form afraid of this thing. Um, I'm not afraid of the, 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 I'm assuming that leadership knows something I don't and they're, they're doing what they think they should do. Um, and I understand that. I understand that. But I want to talk to you. There's, there's something that I'm not sure how all that fits with it or fits with this day, but I do kind of understand it because of the pressure that is going to come on a believer. It's coming. I'm telling you, pressure from the world is coming. We've spent the last 20 years, 25 years of the nation being desensitized to faith. And even now, it's to the point that churches question whether God really cares, whether God really will intervene for us. Um, I know it sounds nuts, but prayer is something you do when you can't do anything else. And um, that's not the case. God is faithful, He's powerful, and He's able. And there's nothing He can't do, and there's nothing He won't do for His people. Now that pressure is going to bring because by and large, most of us have never been, um, since we were in high school, really deal with peer, peer pressure a whole bunch. But this kind of pressure is going to rest on people. And I want to talk to you about what happens if you do fail. Y'all okay? I know I'm not supposed to do this. This sounds weird, a weird thing to preach on. Um, 
but I want you to turn to Luke twenty two thirty one. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that I have a problem. That, that verse right there really bothers me. Jesus could have said, no, can't have him. Can't sift him. Not going to allow it. He could have said that because Jesus is Lord. He's not subject to the devil's wishes. But rather than saying there's no such thing as sifting, he said, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And then, and, and so, so far that sounds good, right? My faith's not going to fail. But then he says this, and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. It's almost like Jesus went bipolar there for a second and said, I'm praying for you that you will not fail. But after you do fail and return to me, you'll strengthen the brethren. And so this prophecy to Peter is it comes on the heels of Jesus telling people that they're going to deny him and everyone's just saying the same stuff. They're all saying, never. I would never. Jesus, I would never. Man, I love you so much. I would never, ever, ever deny you. I would never. Scatter, because he, he gives a prophecy out of Isaiah that says they strike the shepherd and the sheep scatter, is it Psalms? And, and he, say, he said this, and so they're all saying, all the disciples, it's not just Peter, they're all just the same boat. Oh, we, no way. We would never leave you. We're ready to go prison for you. We're ready to do whatever. Um, you know, and then, and then Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny three times that you know me. And so this is the first thought. And so I realized as I'm talking about this, everyone in here is thinking, never be me. That's, that's what we think. I would never, ever do this. I would never, and, and it includes a guy in this pulpit, I would never, ever re deny Jesus. I would never, ever back off. I, I wouldn't do this. I'm ready to suffer for His name's sake if it needs to be. I'm ready to be persecuted. Whatever, I will go to prison with you. I'm ready to even die for you, Jesus. And that's what they're saying. And then, and then another portion Jesus is telling about someone is about to betray him. And um, <laughs> they actually said, all of the guys actually said, well, Lord, is it me? Yeah. <laughs> One minute they're saying, is it me? And the next minute they're saying, I never, I would never. And I think all of us feel this way that we could never ever possibly deny Jesus. We could never ever possibly walk away and I think that's why I said that about being humble because you are capable um, I've seen most of you do it at different times and, and believe it or not I've seen me do it at different times succumb to the pressure to the sifting the shaking and and that's what it is the devil's trying to you, know, you understand this term sifting is that you put something in and you got a little screen you shake it until stuff falls through it and so the devil, right off the bat, was going to try to shake Simon out. He was going to try to get rid of him. Simon was saying, no way. I would never, ever do that. I can hear it coming at me right now. Preacher, we're not Simon. We'll never, ever do that. Um, but I want to read on to you because you're going to. Some of you are going to. You're going to fail. Everyone does. So quiet in here. You're speaking curses over me. No, I'm, I'm really not. I'm really not. I'm telling you that everyone here is subject to this pressure. And you need to understand the times in which we're living now, that there will be intense pressure. There's going to be intense pressure. Listen to me. There's going to be intense pressure. 
there, there's a, there's the, the pressure becomes, I remember Ebola and, and I was slated to travel and preach and, and do all this work and had big, big thing with, met with leaders. We actually got, the, during that trip, um, we met with leaders and, and um, just a little later because of some of those meetings, the, the child slavery was banished in that nation and and yet everyone was saying you can't go to Ghana because you know it was three or four hundred miles from from the country that was infected with Ebola it was a part of the world and and truth is is that stuff's a lot of places we just don't hear about it um but we're, we're told not to go and people put pressure even people from the household of faith that loved me and I understand that love um, but a lot of it's just fear it was just this idea that we're going to control your coming and going and um, we're going to take free people and in order to keep everyone safe we're going to isolate you and you know and so there's this, there's this thing that's happening. I'm telling you what's being released on the earth. And I don't think you're hearing me. Is there's going to be pressure and fear like we've never witnessed. And I know some of you rest with the fact that Jesus is going to come back and rescue us all out of this. Um, he is coming back. And he may take us all out of this. Or he may take us through it to prove that you are faithful. There are scriptures that would evidence, although we know, and, and I know this because I read the Bible. And you can know this because you can read the Bible too. We know that the, the rapture, the, the rapture that people teach can't happen till the abomination of desolation according to Second Thessalonians because Paul wrote a letter in First Thessalonians to some people called Thessalonians and they lived in a place called Thessal Th Thessalonica and he wrote a letter telling them about the day is coming the, the, the day of Jesus return and so they all quit work they got a little commune and they were just waiting for the day of the Lord and it didn't come as soon as they thought and this is in the Bible and so then they begin to question why Paul had lied to them and why hadn't they seen the day coming and Paul wrote to them in 2nd Thessalonians and said I don't want you to be unaware he said that day is coming but it won't come first till you see the abomination desolation desolation which is the Antichrist taking a seat in the temple which happens according to all the prophecies in three and a half years in so we know that that has to happen before a rapture how do I know because I read the Bible and if you believe Revelation and you read Revelation, you'll also find that it isn't until Revelation 19 that Jesus has a resurrection and comes back to the earth, which is far at the end of the tribulation. In fact, it calls Jesus coming the finishing the tribulation. And so that's when they're caught up together with him and come with him. That's in the Bible. It's not this, it's, as far as I'm concerned, I read two verses that say the truth. I read them. They both say the same thing. I believe them. You can believe whoever you want, whatever you want. You can make up verses that don't exist if you like. But me, I'm going to read and I'm going to be prepared for the pressure that's coming. That's what tribulation means. It means pressure. Um, it actually is like the olive press or the, the wine press. They take something free and squash it till the juices run out. That's tribulation. And so what's going to happen in this time is pressure. You're too worried about numbers and marks of the beast and all that stuff. But you're talking about pressure. And it's a world system that's coming against the gospel. And so here you are. And they are facing, these, these 12 disciples are facing immense pressure in the coming days. They're already living in a moment when people are threatening to kill Jesus. They're are already living in this moment. Some of you can't see it. It may not come on this generation, but this, we have crossed a line, I'm telling you, and there's going to be increasing pressure on the saints. Anyway, 
There was, these guys were under intense pressure because the one they were following is now under the scrutiny of the, the high court, the Sanhedrin. They're looking for ways to kill him. They set it in their heart to kill him before the Passover. They set it in their heart to destroy him before the Passover. It could be that the enemy has set it in his heart to destroy us before the Passover. It could be that this time is to strip us of freedom and liberty. And I'm not talking political. I'm talking spiritually. It could be that an anemic church is fearful because we've tried prayer and it didn't work immediately. And so now we want to hide. We can almost see us clutching our hand sanitizer with a mask on our face, hiding from others until this whole thing blows over. It's not going to blow over. It's a virus. It's released. It's here. It's going to be here. It's going to stay here. I'm telling you the truth. We've crossed a line. It's a pandemic. Every flu we have at one point became a pandemic. And so here's the thing. We shouldn't live in fear because we have a higher call. Jesus was telling Simon, look, buddy, son, you're going to do this. And I'm praying for you. You're going to go through this thing. And I'm praying for you that when you come through it, you'll be changed. You will turn. You will change. And you will strengthen the brethren. You will not be isolated. You will not be drawn out. The things that we fear the most pushes us into the darkest hole. So, you know the story. They came to arrest Jesus. It sure is quiet here. I don't know if it's too somber. I think it's just the understanding that we've crossed a line. And we all know it. We all know that life in America will not go back to the same. Anywhere in the world, it will be different. It's been inching toward that all along. But anyway, so what do we do? We take up arms? No. No. We're not killers. We're believers. We, we're called to love, not revolt. We're called to pray for our government. This, this is where a lot of Christians don't like it. They, they want to pull out their guns because a lot of Christians aren't Christians, they're wolves. Wolves love a fight. But lambs don't want to fight. Lambs pray. Lambs seek. Lambs love. Lambs are passive. No wolf has ever been attacked by a lamb. I'm preaching right. This is a, we're not to revolt. That's, there is a higher calling on us than that of the Constitution of the United States. And it is to pray for those that curse you. It is to bless and do not curse. Oh, hear me today. You have the power of life and death in your tongue. And the Bible says bless and do not curse. Because what you say will happen. Oh, hear me. We are not called to be revolutionists. We are called to be reformers. Yes. Oh, that's different. And so Jesus had told Peter, he said, man, you're going to strengthen the brother. You're going to come through with flying colors. After you fail, you'll be converted. And I don't think that we truly see the extent to which he failed. If you'll turn to Matthew 26, this is really a bit wild. Verse 69. Now they came and they had arrested Jesus. Peter stood up. He, was, he, he had been asleep. They were sleeping in the garden while Jesus was praying. And he wiped the sleep out of his eyes and he sees these guys. So he pulls out his sword, which Jesus told him to get. And he whacks off a guy's ear, but he wasn't shooting for the ear. He wasn't just wasn't good with a sword. He was aiming for... I mean, if he would have been better with a sword 
that whole verse would have read a lot different about, you know, but instead he grazes the guy's because the guy probably did that and he got his ear. The ear falls in the ground on the dirt. Jesus picks it up, puts it back on the guy's head and rebukes Peter. And so Peter's probably a little offended. He said, I told you. I would not deny you. I'll go to prison and even die for you. And he was proving. And so he took the, he aimed for the head, got the ear. And then they had Jesus in the Sanhedrin. Two disciples came as John and Peter. And John knew the high priest, so he was allowed into the meeting. But Peter came in and at the doorway, one of the servants says, I know you. You're the... You're, you're with him. And it turned out that that servant was the cousin of Malchus who got his ear whacked off. And she said, I know you. Weren't you there? Because that person was there also. And Peter said, no, not me. Let's just read on. And Peter said, outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him saying, the reason I know all that I just gave you, it's in John. It's in John, but I'm reading. Um... Matthew, because it tells a part that none of the others tell. Now Peter sat outside in the courtyard, and a servant gave, girl came to him saying, you also were with Jesus of Galilee, but he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you're saying. Um, right at first he begins to lie. said, nope, wouldn't me. I don't even know what you're talking about. I just happen to be here right now. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, this fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. But again, he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. Now, uh, he, he said, basically, I swear it. And so for us, I swear it's no big deal. People use it all the time. I, I swear, it's true. In those days... To take an oath upon a lie was something you just didn't do. And he was so pressurized and so fearful that he took an oath to say, I was not there. I mean, we're talking about epic failure. He didn't say, okay, okay, you got me. He said, no, I'm taking an oath. I swear, you know, I was not there. So he's saying, he took an oath, saying, you know, put your hand on the Bible. Do you swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. He did that. I don't know if they had a Bible. I don't know if that was a wording. But he took an oath that he was telling the truth. Y'all all right? I think we all kind of do that in denial. We tend to become very defensive. And it'll, it'll cause you, fear will cause you to overstate every time. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you're saying. And when he'd gone out, okay, I already did that one, didn't I? Was there, this fellow was with Jesus. But again, he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. In other words, you talk like a hillbilly. <laughs> then he began to curse and swear saying I don't know the man and immediately a rooster crowed now curse to us is saying like the four letter words in this thing cursing and swearing is not just using wrong words it is taking an oath accompanied with a curse so he went from just swearing to, to pronouncing a curse upon himself if he's lying. That's how bad he wanted out of this situation that he was in, that he was willing to even take a curse upon himself if he was lying and he knew he was. We tend to, to want to overstate. We tend to want to get ourselves out of that situation. We'll tend to... to you know, you, yeah. I'm trying not to be too much in our business, but we'll tend to tell a lie and stick to it. To the point that we even begin to make oaths 
which are serious with God. Because what we don't understand about God is He's more about our word and our belief than He is our actions. That's why we're justified by faith, not by abstinence. He really tends to really hold our words in high regard, higher than us. And so Peter, he's, he's denying. Then he's swearing he wasn't there. And finally he said, I swear, and if I was there, may my bed be infested with a thousand fleas of camels or something like that. I don't know. Or may, there, may, may the plagues of the earth come. I don't know what kind of curse he was saying that went along with his oath. But what boiled down to from that moment... Peter was cursed. From that moment that he uttered those lies, he became cursed. Y'all all right? Well, I don't believe that. I, I don't believe it. Jesus did because he said that when you're converted or when you return to me. So at some point, Peter turned away from Jesus. Jesus seen it coming, warned him, and he still did it. So now, Peter has a journey back to the Lord. He has to return. Boy, it is quiet here at St. Mary's. Maybe we should have just done a live steaming, streaming, live steaming, live streaming. I don't know. It's, it's quiet in here. Um, because I think some of us, the... the the gravity of the moment's too much for us. But, but at that moment, he was busted. The rooster crowed. And he went out and he wept bitterly because he knew at that moment, what have I done? I don't even think, I think he was calculating. I think he knew what he was doing. I think he had calculated the fact, would I rather die tonight or live with a curse? I think he chose the curse. And he himself had made himself cursed. A lot of us, whether we realize it or not, most of the curses that we have upon our lives are not because someone else put them there, but because we've made these oaths and we've made these decisions and now we live with the consequences of a bad decision that we just didn't see any other way. And that's where he was. He was between what we call a rock and a hard place. And he couldn't see any other way other than saying, I wasn't there. No, I swear I wasn't there. No, if I was there, let God blah, blah, blah. That is the desperation of Peter was calling this out. And so he's, he's now thoroughly cursed in his mind so he's weeping bitterly because this is the night that Peter lost everything this was the night that he that the realization that come the last three and a half years of his life were wasted because now he was outside of Jesus he had denied the one that he believed that he loved in one moment, he's ready to fight to the death for him. In the next moment, he was swearing with curses. And what happened was, is the, the psychology, the, 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 the condition of it, not the psychology, the, that's stupid, Craig, come on. Um, the condition of his thinking, his mindset becomes so twisted at that point, he felt like God could not use him, that his day was over, that he was finished because he had this anointing, he had this presence, he had this glory, he had this revelation, and now even though Jesus said the gates of hell could not prevail against it, now he has surrendered it by calling on them. And so many times, that's what happens with our authority, is we surrender. And when we do that, the enemy will take our authority and use it against us. If you're not carrying your own authority, I promise you the enemy is going to be using it against you. 
So in a time of denial or in a time of betrayal, if you want to call it that, you have to be especially careful because if you're not real careful and you don't turn quickly, you, the enemy will take what you have and he'll use it against you. He'll use the very blessings of God in your life against you. Because there's no vacuum. There's no void. Um, the devil is not I don't know, Citibank or whoever you owe money to and they give you a grace period. The moment he's invoked, he'll show up and begin to feed on you. There's no grace period. God, there's a lot of grace. But the devil doesn't have any. And so the moment he's invoked, the moment he is called on, oh, you're, you're getting quiet to me now. That's why what you say is so important in these times of crisis. Because he doesn't have no grace. The devil, I don't know if you know it, he's mean. He's bad. He, do, he doesn't have any inkling of mercy. He doesn't have any and he won't give it. He doesn't look at you and say, boy, I even feel sorry for that one. In fact, that's his favorite thing. Is when we begin to feel sorry for us, ourselves, that's his favorite move. He sees dinner. Is he, remember, he is a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He's, in other words, he's on the hunt. He's on the prowl. And he wants to eat you. And so, when we're in denial we tend to be defensive. We tend to overstate things. And so I'm telling you this so you can get to know yourself. When preachers preach like this, we tend to say, oh, he's not talking to me. And you find yourself saying that, I'm probably talking to you. Um... <laughs> I don't want anyone to be devil meal. Amen. So when you get in that pressurized state, so some of you are thinking, boy, he is downer today. I thought we were going to talk about how we have power over all the diseases. You have as much authority as you use. You have as much as you use. So first of all, take authority over yourself, possess your own vessel, and then attack. Some of you have been involved in warfare that you're not ready for. And you need to humble yourself and correct your steps so you don't get that attack. This may be one of the most beneficial messages I've ever preached. Let me tell you how this works. The devil does not attack you when you're in your low. When you're in your low, you started that attack weeks ago. That's what he was telling Peter. He said, the devil wants to sift you. And Peter had just said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. The attack of the enemy forms the moment you receive a revelation for others. At that moment, the devil sees it. He sees it before you do and begins to, de begins to form a plan of attack. And that weakness, God knows. And so he gives you warning. And he wasn't just sitting around. He, Jesus wasn't whining the day he was talking about people betraying him, denying him. He wasn't feeling sorry for him. So nobody likes me. I'm going to have to go die and all these suckers are going to leave me. No one cares about me. No one loves me. Even Peter, he's going to deny me. 
He's prophesying to them and telling them, whether they knew it or not, that that thing was already in their heart to deny him. He, in Jesus' mind, they had already done it because he's seen it coming. I'm, I'm preaching so right. And so what happens is, is you have a great revelation. You have a, if you're in ministry, you have a great day. And next thing you know, on the heels of that greatness, the attack comes. Remember Elijah? He just killed 450 prophets of Baal. The next day, he was in the wilderness asking God to kill him. Because that attack follows on the heels of success. Not when you're low, but when you're high. When you've just done something for God and you begin to beat your chest and say, not me, I'll never. Bam, the sifting has started. Listen to me. I've been through this a time or two. It's in the heels of the greatest victory comes the greatest attack. And we always say it like, well, something good's about to happen. No, this attack is retaliation for what happened yesterday. And what you do with this attack determines what's going to happen tomorrow. And so you have to take the authority over that thing that's coming against you like Jesus did. And say, get behind me. Satan, because you don't have the things of God in mind. You have the things of man. That's not easy. It sounds easy. And we strut around beating our chest. Us charismatics, get behind me, Satan. But here's the thing. To say that, you can't think like a man. You have to think like God. Because the attack was that Peter was thinking like men. When he said, I will follow you to prison and death. Are you following me? And so these attacks, we think, oh, something must be about to break loose. It could be all that hell if you don't learn how to walk in authority. Oh, I'm preaching so good. I'm telling you, if you listen to what I'm saying, it'll save you years of suffering. Years of defeat. So what you do is in the middle of success, you humble yourself before God. You don't beat your chest and say, do you see what God did? You humble yourself and say, dear God, thank you for mercy. Thank you for revelation. Thank you for all the things you do. I humble myself before you. Everything is from you. Everything is for you and everything is to you. You don't run around boasting, beating your chest. Did you see that? Well, I'm just testifying. No, you're boasting. You're bragging. And I'm telling you, defeat is coming. (laughs) I'm not happy about it. But I see it. The moment, I, I mean, sometimes... And we've all been guilty of this. God will use us, and we want everyone to know. Did you see what God did through me? As we grow in the Lord, we get more subtle about it and better at it. But we have to learn to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. If you use your authority over you, you'll have plenty for everyone else. I don't know, sometimes I think believers think if they use their authority on themselves, then they won't have enough for everyone else. Um, (laughs) Use your authority for you. Everything that happens to you is not, that looks like a blessing is not always a blessing and everything that looks like a curse is not always a curse. Sometimes it's a change. And in Peter's life, his vow with curses become his turning point. Y'all got quiet. It become his turning point. Because of his response. He quit defending himself. He went out and wept bitterly. Because he knew that he had denied Jesus. And so victory for him was right around the corner. But for Judas, it was eternal. 
It was also Judas' turning point when he kissed Jesus. Are you hearing me? Same guys, same master, same teacher, same Lord. One of them submitted, the other resisted. One of them denied out of fear, the other denied out of rebellion. I'm telling you, we're living in a time where you're going to be faced with it. If you're not already. I know our kids already are at school. And I don't feel sorry for them. I don't. I feel excited that we've got a group of people that are learning how to stand in the midst of trials. You don't get strong by being in a vacuum. You get strong because you're, you're, you're working muscles. And if you begin to work faith, both at school and in the job and different places, you get strong. And you learn how to use authority over yourself. Sometimes the biggest problem I need to bind is not the devil, but is me. Get behind me, Satan, because you do not have the things of God in mind, but the things of man. And so that means that sometimes that my mind will think what the devil thinks and say what the devil says. That's what happened to Peter. Right after he had said, thou art the son of God. So we're not talking about salvation. Some of you are still thinking salvation because that's all you can think about is what's going to happen when I die. It's not about dying, it's about living. And so sometimes if you're not real careful, your mind will think thoughts that you think and your mouth will say things that the devil has planted in your thoughts. You'll become irrational, angry, you shout, beat your chest, cry, feel good, bad, loved, unaccepted. All those feelings, all those emotions that come with human thought, they'll come out and they'll become manifestations of darkness. And in Peter's case, he had went further than Judas. Judas made no curses. He swore no oaths. He just took some money. 30 pieces of silver. And he didn't even keep it. Turn to Mark chapter 16. Now understand Peter is cursed. I'm sorry, I guess this is a bummer of a sermon for many, but for me it's life. And maybe it's just for me. Jesus said, now, I mean, this is, a, this is three days, period. From the time Jesus, the time Peter had denied Jesus, till now Jesus has risen from the dead. Isn't that good news? Three days have went by, and Peter's in a bad place. He's cursed. Y'all okay? He did it to himself. And so the angel, they, they came to see Jesus. And when they entered, the, verse 5, Mark 16, 5. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe, sitting on the right side. And, when and, and they were alarmed. I'm like, uh, you think? But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go. Tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he has said to you. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. But verse 7 is the one I want to emphasize a little bit, because Peter is the only cursed disciple at this point. And he says, but go, tell his disciples and Peter... Now, Peter's still on the outside. He's not a disciple anymore. But Jesus is calling him home. Are you all okay? You're getting quiet. Some of you think, oh no, he was still just a no. Jesus said, you'll have to return to me. He had departed the faith. He had left Jesus. 
That's what it says. Was he going to go to hell or heaven? I don't know. I don't think in those terms. That's not the way I think about it. I think he was, wasn't following Jesus. By the way, that's the way I think of you. You're following Jesus or not. I don't think about you in heaven or hell. I'm, it's above my pay grade. It's not my call. My question is, 